The top stories tonight in Y News. The Okta Research Group projects COVID-19 cases in Metro Manila might reach to 500 daily by the end of June if the increase in infections continue. Health workers in some private hospitals have yet to receive their one COVID allowance. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority is looking to tighten rules on the use of e-bikes and e-scooters. And Australians have been warned to expect blackouts across the East Coast as an emergency crisis grips one of the world's biggest coal and gas producers. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Tuesday, June 14, 2022. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. I am William Theo. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News & Rescue social media accounts. First in the news, daily COVID-19 cases in Metro Manila might reach 400 to 500 by the end of June, according to the Okta Research. The group also projects the capital may escalate to moderate COVID-19 risk classification next week. Rosa Nicos will tell us why. The Philippines sees an uptick in new COVID-19 cases. Based from the report of the Department of Health, the daily average of new COVID-19 cases this week is 240. This is 30.4% higher from the week before or from May 30 to June 5, 2022. And yesterday, Metro Manila has 188 new COVID-19 infections. Okta Research Fellow Professor Guido David said Metro Manila may have 400 to 500 COVID-19 cases per day by end of June because of the steady increase in new infections in the region. However, he noted that the increase in healthcare utilization for COVID-19 cases remains low. Medyo bumibilis yung pagtaas ng bilang ng kaso kasi dati uh, nasa mga 65 cases lang tayo per day tapos uh, baka umabot na siya ng mga 400 to 500 by end of June. So uh, bumibilis na yung talaga yung pagtaas ng bilang ng kaso. The group also projects the capital may escalate to moderate from low COVID-19 risk classification by next week. The decision to raise the alert level in Metro Manila remains to be a possibility. Nasa low risk pa tayo sa Metro Manila, um, green pa siya. Mm -hmm. Pero by next week, we're projecting nasa moderate risk na tayo, yellow. So, um, nasa projections din yan. Eh. So, kumaga, yung current situation natin, hindi pa naman siya um, uh, nangangahulugan magtataas tayo ng alert level. Pero this is a possibility uh, within the next few weeks. Of course, uh, decision yan ng uh, Department of Health at ng Interagency Task Force. And while the number of non-COVID-19 patients admitted is increasing in private hospitals, the Private Hospitals Association of the Philippines Incorporated says it is also monitoring the number of COVID-19 patients. Same with the DOH, FAPI recommends to continue the wearing of face masks outdoors. I don't want to believe that if you're out of the way, you can get out of the way. You can see that right now, it's still going to be cases natin. So, that means the virus is still here. You know? So, uh, we should not forget na itong isang uh, wearing of mask na uh, is a good barrier or protection para sa, ano, sa virus. You know? So, dapat hindi natin to kalimutan na gawin. Okta Research reminded the public, follow health protocols, get boosters, and protect the vulnerable. Professor David also urged companies to implement flexi-work arrangement or allow employees to work from home to avoid further transmission. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Philippine National Police expressed readiness to implement stringent health and safety protocols in the case uh, the national government decides to heighten the alert level status in Metro Manila. Lea Ilagan reports. The Philippine National Police will strictly enforce the government's health and safety protocols regardless of what alert level 
will be declared in the National Capital Region. This as the metro is experiencing an uptick of COVID-19 cases in the past week. PNP spokesperson Police Colonel Jean Fajardo says the PNP is ready to implement restrictions should NCR shift to alert level 2. Yung ating restrictions pagdating po doon sa mga capacity po ng mga indoor establishments po, very clear po doon sa, sa, sa mga guidelines na inilabas ng IATF pagka sa ang isang lugar po ay nasa alert level 2, mga 50% lang po ang po pwede doon po sa mga indoor establishment po at doon naman po sa mga uh, outdoor and mga around 70% capacity po ang inaalaw. The mandatory wearing of face masks and the observance of physical distancing will also be enforced. We will remind them that there is uh, still a uh, viral na pandemic sa ating uh, mga buong bansa actually, ma'am. No? So, papalalahanan natin sila yung minimum public health protocol, yung uh, pagsusuot ng face mask. At uh, yung iba naman po kasi, ma'am, may mga pagkakataon na nakakaligtaan ng isuot. Kaya ang mga polis natin, ang mga nagpapatrol at nailalagay po natin doon sa mga designated uh, areas po nila ay pinapaalalahanan. Fajardo warned they will not hesitate to arrest those who will refuse to wear face masks and are repeat offenders. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Private Hospitals Association of the Philippines disclosed there are workers in some private hospitals who are still waiting for their one COVID-19 allowance. Aiko Miguel will give us the details live. Uh, yes, Psycho, good evening. Go ahead. Yes, William, good evening. The Budget Department has released the 7.9 billion pesos last February for the COVID for the one COVID-19 or OCA allowance of frontliners in the country's COVID-19 response. However, William, the Private Hospitals Association of the Philippines Incorporated or P Happy said Healthcare workers in private hospitals have yet to receive their allowance. Be happy President Dr. Jose René de Grano said there are 550 hospitals that are active members of Be Happy. Maganda yung mga panukala ng paglibibigay nito mga benefits na ganito. But then yung implementation ng pagbibigay, laging inire-reklamo ng ating mga ano mga healthcare workers. Kasi yung sinasabing release ng mga SRA na yan at mga OPA, eh hindi agad uh, na implement William, with this situation, health workers prefer to work abroad than stay in the country. Now the country experienced shortage of health workers. Sa katagalan na, pag apply na sila sa abroad, ni hindi nga, pan, nakaalis na nga sila at lahat, eh hindi pa rin nare-release ano, itong mga benefits na ganito. And kung may lumabas dyan na uh, more than 10,000 na mga nurses, ay kulang na kulang talaga uh, ang pag-replenish ng mga nag-aalis sa natin mga nurses. At talagang mahihirapan tayo pag nagkaroon again ng surge. You know? William, based on the guidelines, the granting of OCA to public and private healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers serving the country's COVID-19 response shall be based on risk classification to high, moderate, or low risk of the eligible public and private healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers as guided by the DOH Administrative Order Number 2022-001. The rate of OCA is from 3,000 pesos to 9,000 pesos. The computation of the actual OCA shall be based on the number of hours physically reporting for work during the month. In a statement, the Department of Health said they, they welcome closer coordination with all hospitals, including members of Be Happy, to allow faster distribution of the one COVID-19 allowance to the serving healthcare workers. William Private Hospitals are also required to enter in a memorandum of agreement to enable the DOH Centers for Health Development to transfer funds and pool accounting or liquidation of any funds previously given. And that is the latest live. Back to you, William. Yes, uh, thank you, Aiko Miguel, reporting live from Quezon City. Incoming Department of Labor and Employment Secretary Bienvenido Laguesma 
thumbs down the proposal to implement a national minimum wage amid the rising prices of goods in the country. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. Labor groups have been calling for national minimum wage after regional wage boards impose minimum wage hikes. Groups are pushing for a 750 pesos national minimum wage. But according to incoming Labor Secretary Benvenido Laguesma, the proposal is not feasible as it will only affect the small businesses in the country still reeling the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Laguesma said the welfare of the small businesses should also be considered in the decision for wage hike. Pagi nating iniisip, kulang ito, dagdag tayo, dagdag, dagdag. Eh, hindi, maka, hindi yan makakahabol sa pagtaas ng presyo ng bilihin. No? So, dapat there is always a balance between the concern ng manggagawa at saka naman yung kakayahan ng employer na magpatuloy ng hanap buhay, makapagbigay ng taragdagang oportunidad sa ating mga kababayan. The incoming Labor Chief also called on the Regional Tripartite Wages and Productivity Boards to work on increasing the productivity of businesses alongside wage hikes. Actually, dapat tignan natin kung ginagampanan ba talaga ng regional tripartite wages and productivity boards yung kanilang mandate. Kasi hindi dapat nakabalot lamang sa usapin tungkol sa pagtaas ng sweldo. Eh. The Labor Group Trade Union Congress of the Philippines earlier said that the continued increase in fuel prices will water down the value of the salary adjustments recently approved by the regional wage boards. Nel Maribuho, UN TV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, provincial bus operators will seek an additional fare increase from the Land Transportation Franchising and Regulatory Board. J.P. Nunez reports why. Amid the rising cost of fuel, the Provincial Bus Operators Association of the Philippines will file a petition before the LTFRB seeking an increase. They would ask for an additional 50 cents per liter or 50 peso per 100 kilometers. The group's executive director, Alex Yage, said they would file their petition this week. Within uh, tomorrow, tomorrow or uh, the day after, as a Inincorporate namin yung pagtaas ngayon ng uh, diesel uh, ngayong araw na to. Nakikita nga namin ang, uh, ang futures ng, uh, ng diesel, ng crudo, ay uh, palagi ko tataas pa sa mga susunod na araw. So kailangan makapag-file kami ng petition. Yage Ade, they also have to deal with the increases in the minimum wage of their workers and toll fees. The transport group Pasang Mazda shares the same sentiment. Despite the approval of the 1 peso provisional increase, they believe it is useless as their expenses on diesel are now doubled. Pasang Mazda President Obet Martin confirmed that they will still ask the LTFRB for another 2 peso provisional increase for jeepneys. They expect the approval of the board after the last scheduled hearing before the end of June. Well, when it's a matter of unleading in the next administration, at that, you know, I'm getting the next administration, but then we're going to have a promise. So, I'm going to have a lot of money. The LTFRB is set to hear the petition seeking additional fare before the term of President Duterte ends. JP Nunez, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Department of Education, or DepEd, plans to hire volunteer tutors and help early learners transition to face-to-face -face learning. Janice Ingente reports why. To address the needs of students who are still struggling through their school lessons, the Department of Education plans to strengthen its tutorial program or Brigada Pagbasa, especially for early grade learners. According to Education Undersecretary Tonisito Omali, they could expand the program to include tutorials on other subjects such as math. Uh, we, we launched this uh, prior to the pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, COVID happened. Kaya po yung uh, disenyo po nito na magkaroon po sana ng mga volunteers tayo from the private sectors na pwede pong tumulong after school uh, setup, uh, mga bata na hindi gaano uh, marunong magbasa, marunong magbasa, hindi nakakasabay sa lesson. 
The DepEd Brigada Pagbasa program was first launched in 2019 in partnership with the World Vision to address reading illiteracy. Omali added that through the program, they will be able to collaborate with the private sector that can provide volunteer tutors and learning kits. Uh, pero kung walang kakayanan yung, ang, ang magulang, eh, papano na yung bata? Yun po yung gusto sana natin mangyari sa Brigada Pagbasa. And, at yan po yung dapat uh, pag, uh, isa sa mga pinag-uusapan po dito, paano po makakatulong ang pribadong sektor. Yun po yung nakikita po natin. Bibitbitin po natin ito sa atin pong uh, incoming uh, secretary and uh, let's take it uh, from there. The agency would present the proposal to incoming education secretary and Vice President Alexara Duterte Carpio. Deped reassures that with this program, no child will be left behind. Janice Inhente, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Bureau of Immigration will monitor the driver who ran over a security guard in Mandaluyong City and who has skipped proceedings by the Land Transportation Office. Eileen Cerudo has the report. The name of the SUV driver who hit a security guard in Mandaluyong City last June 5 is already encoded in the system of the Bureau of Immigration. This was after the Department of Justice released an immigration lookout bulletin against the said driver. If encountered itong passenger na ito in uh, any airport or seaport nationwide, we refer the matter po to the Department of Justice and other government agencies to confirm if this person uh, who is the subject of an immigration lookout bulletin has a pending warrant of arrest. Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara said they received a request for a lookout bulletin from the Office of the City Prosecutors of Mandaluyong. However, despite the imposed lookout bulletin, the Immigration Bureau clarified they will only monitor the said individual and not bar him from leaving the country. The agency explains the BI will only monitor if there are any pending cases against him. To make sure na itong taong ito ay uh, uh, walang pending na warrant of arrest at kailangan po i-coordinate po ito with the proper authorities to make sure po na uh, uh, siya po ay walang pending na warrant of arrest. In a statement, meanwhile, BI Commissioner Jaime Morente reported they received information that the suspect attempted to leave the country. A frustrated murder complaint and abandonment of one's own victim is filed against the SUV driver. Authorities are still waiting for the court to release a warrant before proceeding. Eileen Cerudo, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Commission on Elections or COMELEC has commenced the preparations for the Barangay and Sangguniang Kabataan elections on December this year. The poll body also projects over 66 million registered voters in the polls. Dante Amento will tell us why. The Commission on Elections recently clarified that unless there is a law to postpone the Barangay and Sangguniang Kabataan or SK elections, they are obliged to start their preparations. This year's Barangay and SK elections is scheduled on December 5, 2022. Comelec Acting Spokesperson Director Jan Rex Laudianco says, they have already started their preparations upon the direction of the Comelec and Bank, with Commissioner Ray Bulay as the commissioner in charge. Laudianco added their preparations include the drafting of implementing rules for the elections, procurement of ballot paper and election supplies, procurement of printing services for the official manual ballots, accountable and non-accountable forms, revisiting the health protocols including the provision for the installment of isolation polling place or IPP, in voting centers in coordination with the IATF. The poll body will also open the resumption of voter registration which is tentative on July 4 to 30, 2022 upon the approval of the Comelec and Bank. Based on the Comelec's projection, there will be over 66 million registered voters in the Barangay and SK elections. Meanwhile, over 23 million are registered voters for the SK elections. Dante Amento, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. 
Senator-elect Robin Padilla expressed his readiness to work as a first-time senator as he visited the Senate today. He adds he is excited to debate with his colleagues in the vernacular language. Harleen Delgado will tell us why. Senator-elect Robin Padilla attended a briefing on the legislative processes at the Senate today. He says it is part of his preparations for his upcoming work as a first-time legislator. According to the neophyte senator, he is now 100% ready to go to work. Padilla is poised to sit as the next chairperson of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, a post that was given to lawyer senators since 1986. When asked how difficult is it to prepare for such an enormous task, Padilla says, Mabigat yun kung hindi mo alam yung gagawin mo, pero ako naman alam ko naman yung gagawin ko. At nandiyan naman si Atone Rabal, nandiyan yung mga abogado na mag-guide sa atin. Hindi naman ako nabibigat ako. The actor turned senator adds he is ready to debate with his colleagues, but in Filipino and not the usual English language. Una, hindi naman Amerikano yung mga kaharap ko para mag-English ako. Siguro kung Amerikano, well, I'm willing to debate. <laughs> Pero mga Tagalog sila. There is no rule in the Senate that prohibits the use of Filipino language in the proceedings. There are times that senators also speak in their vernacular or a mix of Tagalog and English during hearings, plenary debates, or interjections. Padilla says the first bill that he will file will be about his advocacy, the push for charter change and shift to federalism. Hardin Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And in other news, residents displaced by Mount Pulusan's eruption were now allowed to return home after staying in the evacuation centers for five days. Alan Manansala tells us why. It was last Friday, June 10 when the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or PBOX, detected high activity in Mount Bulusan. The local government of Huban Sorsogon immediately evacuated over 800 residents from Barangay Puting Sapa. By dawn last Sunday, Bulusan volcano erupted again, extending the stay of evacuated families. For some residents, this is becoming their new routine. Ma man sa akon. Eh, siyempre, nagkakabili yun na kayo mag, ano, mag-irina, mga, mga anak ko. Di, sanay namang ako. Kaya pinin na ako naabutan sa Santuga. Di naman ako naninirbis, kay sanay na. Di, dun ako nagurang. But after the second priatic eruption last Monday, Bulusan's activity already declined. This morning, residents staying in evacuation centers were again sent home. Natapos na ang uh, clearing and cleaning operation. Na yun din naman ang naging uh, pangunahing dahilan natin ng pagpapalikas nitong mga residente ito. So main reason talaga natin, since wala naman talaga sila dun sa 4 kilometer permanent danger zone, ang uh, reason po ay talagang health reason. Kaya nga po, paulit-ulit natin uh, sinasabi na yung priority for evacuation natin ay yung mga residente po na mga vulnerable, yung may mga sakit sa baga, yung mga matatanda, at yung mga maliliit na bata. Fivox said a total of 69 volcanic earthquakes were recorded in Mount Bulusan in the past 24 hours. Alan Manansala, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. For the news abroad, Parts of Eastern Australia were warned to expect power shortages early this week as electricity supplies failed to meet demands. Mavian Dog will tell us why live. Good evening, Mav. Good evening, Elsie. Electricity demand multiplied in the states of New South Wales and Queensland after cold snap temperatures hit this winter, with residents using up more energy to generate heat.
On top of that, domestic gas shortages, offline coal generators, and global gas price inflations are drying out power reserves. Millions across both states are warned to expect blackouts this Tuesday evening as generators dial back their supplies. New South Wales Treasurer and Energy Minister Matt Keane tweeted Monday night that the, situa that the situation is currently under control, with the Australian Energy Market Operator, or AEMO, monitoring the crisis closely and dispatching power where needed. Energy Minister and Spokesman Chris Bowen stated that the energy crisis needs to be managed over the coming days, especially in Queensland where supply shortfalls are critically low. PowerLink Queensland Chief Executive Paul Sims Hauser urged residents to be thoughtful of their energy consumption and cut back on use when they can over the next few days, until the government reactivates the coal power stations. Elsie? So Maeve, what are some things the Australian residents can do to help conserve energy? LC energy conservation can be supported by switching off appliances such as computers, televisions and other unused household items. Heaters and use of air conditioners can also be turned down, while commercial businesses LC can reduce unnecessary lights and water heating systems during and outside their operating hours. Back to you, Elsie. Thank you, Mavian Dog, reporting live from Australia. Crews from California to New Mexico battled wildfires that had forced hundreds of people to leave their homes. Roughly 2,500 homes have been evacuated because of the two wildfires burning on the outskirts of Flagstaff in northern Arizona. The wildfire prompted the country to declare an emergency. It's been fueled by high winds that have grounded aircraft as an option for firefighting. Wildfires broke out early this spring in multiple states in the western U.S. where climate change and unenduring drought are fanning the frequency and intensity of forest and grassland fires. The Chinese government is encouraging more than 10 million upcoming college graduates to seek jobs in the countryside. Charis Longbowen will tell us why live. Good evening, Charis. Good evening, Elsie. China's youth unemployment rate in the countryside has hit 18.2% in May, setting the highest level in the country's history. To mitigate this, the ministries of education, finance, civil affairs, and human resources have once again issued a statement urging future college graduates to work in the rural areas of the country instead of fighting for limited job opportunities at the major cities. The government will offer tax incentives incentives and guaranteed loans to graduates who will start businesses in the rural and urban areas. Similar benefits will also be given to existing businesses that will employ graduates. The last appeal was during the initial COVID-19 outbreak in July 2020. COVID-19 lockdown restrictions was a factor that affected many small businesses in the countryside. Furthermore, China's technology industry has also begun to experience underemployment after major companies started to lay off employees following President Xi's regulation on private sectors. Elsie? Cherise, what type of jobs would be on offer for the graduates in the countryside? LC, the Chinese government is aiming to develop the community service industry in the rural and urban areas. So most of the job opportunities will be in the field of hospitality, including elderly and child care, housekeeping, real estate, and other servicing institutions. Back to you, LC. Thank you, Cheris Longbowen, for that live report. The British court has refused to block the policy of deporting asylum seekers of various nationalities in Rwanda. Ryuji Sasaki details the report live. Yes, Ryuji? Good evening, Elsie. Migrant rights supporter asked the Court of Appeal to overturn the lower court, ruling on the deportation plan of immigrants. They argued that the judge made a mistake when he decided Friday not to issue an injunction, but the appeal was rejected Monday. 
Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the first deportation plan of immigrants to Rwanda would go ahead on Tuesday as scheduled. However, the United Nations top refugee official said the policy sets a dangerous precedent for migrants fleeing war and oppression and describing it as all wrong. The deportation plan aims to discourage migrants from risking their lives by paying smugglers to reach the UK in small inflatable boats. The UK paid Rwanda 120 million pounds or 7.7 billion pesos up front and will make additional payments based on the number of people deported. Elsie? Thank you, Ryuji Sasaki, for that report. Every year, approximately 400,000 Canadians donate blood consistently. However, these irregular donors may not be enough to meet the increased demand of blood across the country. Miguel Moldes will tell us why. During the height of the pandemic, demand for blood donations in Canada plummeted as surgeries and other treatments requiring donations were put on hold. Blood collection also slowed down due to physical distancing and other pandemic safety restrictions. Now the nation faces significantly low supply. Hospitals are relying on a smaller group of repeat donors which cannot be sustained in the long term. Experts say recruiting new donors is the key to increasing the supply. The Canadian Blood Services hopes their campaign from June 12 to June 18 can draw in at least 100,000 new donors. Their campaign highlights that aside from helping save lives, donors can experience health benefits themselves. Lowered blood pressure and decreased risk of certain cancers are just some of the positive effects of donating blood. Meanwhile, Filipinos across Canada, including members of the Church of God International, partnered with the Canadian Blood Services to help alleviate the shortage. The group has organized mass blood donations in chapters across Canada and plan to hold more blood drives in the future. Miguel Moldez, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news in other parts of the globe. I am Elsie Marcos, live from Auckland, New Zealand. Good evening. Some electronic kick scooter users were recently reported to have violated the regulations issued by the Land Transportation Office. But the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority finds apprehending the violators challenging. Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. The Land Transportation Office issued an administrative order regulating the use of electric motor vehicles in the country. Every type of electric vehicle have set of rules including speed limit and designated areas of operation, among others. For electric kick scooter or e-scooter, its operation is only limited within barangay roads. However, they may be operated on bicycle lanes or similar lanes designated by proper authorities. Drivers of this vehicle is also required to wear a protective helmet similar to those designed for motorcycle riders. But driver's license and registration of e-scooters are not required. Metropolitan Manila Development Authority Chairman Romando Arte says this aspect of the regulation makes it hard for them to apprehend violators of any of the restrictions. Yung mga nagtatraverse ng ating major thoroughfares na hindi naman po sila dapat doon. Although hindi nga po namin sila mahuli dahil wala po silang lisensya. So hindi po namin alam kung paano sila titikitan. So ang nangyayari po ay pinapapasok po natin sila dito sa ating bike lanes. Para na rin po sa kanilang kaligtasan. Every electric motor vehicle also have corresponding speed limit. E-scooters are only allowed at a maximum speed limit of 12.5 kilometers per hour. But Earl, an e-scooter advocate from San Juan City, says such speed limit is rather unsafe for them and other motorists. Masyado, kasi 12.5, para kang naglalakad ng mabilis. Eh. Uh, uh, magkaka, magkaka bull bull din dito. In 25, Medyo pwede na, no? pero huwag nilang i-regulate yung speed ng scooter kasi kailangan mo. E-scooter eh. e riders who will be caught not using proper helmet may be fined 1,500 pesos, while those operating in a restricted area will be fined 1,000 pesos. The MMDA says they are continuously studying whether they need additional regulation or revisions of such regulation, which they may recommend to the LTO for reconsideration and approval. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. 
Our Kasang Bahay, as the world faces these trying times amid the pandemic caused by coronavirus, we are inviting everyone to join the Global Prayer for Humanity from Monday to Friday, 9.30 p.m. Philippine time through the social media accounts of Members Church of God International. And before we close, we will leave you with the word giving glory to God from the book of 3 John chapter 1, verse 11. It says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Those are the reasons behind the news, June 14, 2022, and reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I am William Theo, because we need to know, we will always ask why. We serve the people, we give glory to God.